Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Next up, we have our our desktop and distro panel, which is going to be chaired by Ed. And then Ed has a various folks. So I'm going to turn over to Ed and let Ed introduce the various folks on our panel and take it from here. All right. Thanks, John. So this is a, a panel discussion uh, focused on downstream uh, projects and in particular um, desktop focused and user focused uh, downstreams, um, what we might call a, a distro um, uh, perhaps. Uh, and so we've, we have uh, Eric from GhostBSD, Simon from Hello System, uh, the two projects, uh, two projects that are built on FreeBSD and are focused on the end user desktop environment. Um, and then we've got uh, Manu and uh, Charlie from uh, for the FreeBSD graphics team, uh, hopefully. So if we have some questions and discussion that happens, uh, we can figure out what we need to do and um, uh, where we need to go. So my, uh, my goal here is to kind of figure out what um, challenges and uh, what FreeBSD does well and what FreeBSD can do to improve the experience um, of our downstream desktop focused community. Uh, and it's going to be a fairly interactive and um, open session. So if there's questions and uh, discussion throughout, um, you know, please uh, use the Q&A in, um, in Zoom and we'll, we'll keep an eye on IRC and YouTube as well as we go. So um, I'll start off. Uh, why don't we start off with uh, Eric? Um, and if you can just give me a, a brief introduction about um, your your distro and sort of what the key features uh, are. Who's your um, sort of prototypical uh, user? Okay. Um, yeah, because well, because this is basically a iOS based on FreePSC that is for basically desktop and laptop. Uh, we focus have to have uh, everything ready for the user um, uh, to use right away when it, it is installed. Uh, the install process is on a live, uh, on a live um, session on a desktop. Um, key features is basically like we try we try to have um, everything like package managing from UI. Um, same things for network um, managing. Mostly right now, it's mostly like um, only Wi-Fi connection. But uh, later, we're gonna have like um, network, like uh, static, and the the ability to change option like uh, static and everything in the UI. Um, it's mostly like we try to make the tool to make it more, uh, goes busy more usable for someone that only knows UI. It's basically what we focus on. That's basically our key uh, feature uh, or mostly our our user are people that are afraid to uh, run a terminal. <laughs> it's a, oh, there's a lot of user that's still good with the terminal, but a um, bunch of users, um, that's what we have for now. Okay, uh, and Simon, uh, same question for you. What, um, give me a little bit of a introduction to Hello System. Um, and uh, sort of who are you, uh, who are you targeting with, uh, with the work you're doing? See, we, uh, we don't hear your audio, uh, Simon. Send a note in the chat.
Okay, we'll um, figure out, uh, we'll try to figure out what's uh, going on with the technical difficulties uh, we're having, but um, uh, I'll uh, go through the, um, the two uh, uh, panelists from the FreeBSD graphics team. Um, so Manu, do you want to uh, uh, introduce yourself briefly and um, let us know what sorts of um, uh, areas of focus, uh, what, what, what areas of the graphics stack you've uh, focused on and, and what you, uh, your background is? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? If someone can tell me if uh, sound is going. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I, I have some delay on the video, so that's, yeah. So it's working now. Yeah, it's working now. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Manu. Uh, my area of interest in previous D is very, very large. Uh, and on the graphics side, uh, it's anything graphics related. Uh, so that's uh, kernel driver, um, uh, user on stacks or uh, Mesa, Xorg, Wayland, etc. And anything that can make uh, well something like I just had uh, does not happen. For example, I was on wait on just before and I needed to start at XORG to join this meeting. Uh, so yeah, I was unaware of this issue. Uh, and yeah, this is something that I will look at it. So yeah, I like to work on everything that make everyone happy. <laughs> All right, thanks. And uh, Charlie? Okay, so I'm Charlie. Uh, that's my uh, FreeBSD uh, username here. I'm actually part of the desktop team and um, and also the GNOME team, which kind of falls under the desktop umbrella, so to speak. And um, yeah, I just wanted to really mostly wanted to hear how the uh, how the downstream uh, distributions are doing. But uh, as for a lot of my work in desktop and GNOME, it's mainly just about uh, keep making sure all the libraries actually work as intended. Uh, make sure that the user experience of uh, of all the all the various uh, desktop environments and window uh, window managers and whatnot are like I said working as intended and um, it really um, probably probably best known for uh, maintaining uh, cinnamon and parts of uh, parts of the GNOME stack. So, um, so yeah, just happy to be here and uh, happy to answer any questions and uh, any other uh, any other uh, inquiries that uh, we may have. Okay, great. And uh, I see Simon is back now. So uh, why don't you uh, introduce us to Hello System and uh, um, what your sort of goals and, and target uh, market is? Hello, sure. So I didn't dial in using Hello System today. I had to use, unfortunately, <clears throat> a different operating system and promptly it crashed on me. I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> so yeah, um, please forgive me. I'm still very new with all of this. Uh, as a matter of fact, I ran FreeBSD on the desktop for the first time not even a year ago. And what started out as this test SSD just to play around with just morphed into my daily work system and I've never switched since and it slowly morphed into what is now Hello System. So all is very new. So if you're asking me who is Hello System for today, well, it's not even in 1.0 yet. But if things go well, and if we bring it to where I would like to bring it, then basically it's for everyone who, well, let me say it this way. I watched very closely people's desktops uh, of the presenters in this, in this um, conference. And I noticed that not everyone is using FreeBSD yet on the desktop and not everyone is even using open source software yet on the desktop. And there are a few people out there who like to have the global menu bar at the top on the, of the screen and the icons on the right hand side in familiar places. And if you are one of those people, then Hello System maybe one day is for you. So okay, great. idea is to make it really friendly, especially to switchers coming from other well-known platforms. Okay, excellent. Um, so um, uh, both, um, uh, Eric and Simon, what um, 
my, one of my questions is sort of what aspects of the FreeBSD um, uh, release and build and distribution process work well for you? For example, um, you know, the, the ports collection, are you able to use um, uh, packages? Uh, do you use upstream uh, packages verbatim? Do you have to build your own? Um, how, how well are uh, you able to integrate with um, uh, FreeBSD? How do you consume FreeBSD? Um, that sort of, sort of thing. Eric, you want to start? Yeah, I can go. Uh, yeah, for us, uh, we use basically the port tree and the, um, uh, and the source code. Uh, we kind we kind of differ a little bit because we use uh, OpenRC for the init system. Other than that, the rest is basically the same. So uh, we, we build the ISO from packages, but all our packages are built from uh, the fork uh, we have. And we also build DOS with ports. Uh, that was from TrueOS. Uh, basically everything that goes with the use right now is forks from TrueOS and we are maintaining it. So when we build an ISO, it's all built from port, uh, from packages, including DOS is a packages. Um, so, okay. Um, yeah. Um, and basically we're, we're building everything ourselves. We're not uh, using anything pre-build from um, FreeBSD, but everything under the hood is basically the same as FreeBSD other than OpenRC. Um, I don't know if I answer everything, but yeah. things is, yeah. Oh, and we use the latest table, which right now is uh, 13.0. Okay, um, and uh, same question for you, Simon. Um, I mean, that, that's one thing I didn't mention specifically, but is a, is a really good point is, uh, is tracking FreeBSD stable branches versus current versus releases that, uh, what, what model you use for um, moving forward to, to newer versions from FreeBSD. Yeah, so actually we're doing this uh, quite differently um, from GhostBSD. In Hello System, we are using all the binaries as they're coming from FreeBSD for the base system and also for the packages. We are currently on 12.2 in the upcoming Hello System 0.5 release. We are also building test builds uh, on 13, but we have found some smaller topics that are not optimized yet that still need to be worked out. And this is why we are currently on 12.2. And um, as a matter of fact, um, we would like to take as much as possible in terms of binaries unchanged from FreeBSD. So we don't want to have a different kernel or different packages, or um, basically we would like to stay as close to the original as possible. Okay. Um... And I guess this is probably the um, the part that's uh, uh, much more kind of open and um, ripe for discussion um, is uh, where do we need to go in in FreeBSD um, with respect to uh, graphics and uh, desktop focused um, uh, needs and how how can the project uh, basically have infrastructure and components in place that um, uh, that you can make use of. Um, I'll, I'll maybe start off with um, either Manu or Charlie if there's any kind of feedback we want to um, start with to seed the discussion. I guess I can. I guess I can. You know. You know. Contribute something here. Um, lately in, um, in places like Discord and IRC and, and a few other spots, but, but also just, I, just even my own, uh, my own experience is just maintaining the desktop ports, 
um, especially with uh, with cinnamon and and, uh, and even helping out with some of the gnome stuff. And actually forgot probably uh, pro probably should also mention that uh, Eric uh, did a lot of the uh, mate porting uh, for the ports trade. Um, you know, quite a bit of it. I actually used mate for quite a bit until I finally got cinnamon to work. Uh, just kind of as a side note. Also, um, but uh, but. He also ported something else, which I will actually uh, get to in this discussion here, which is uh, actually the subject of it. Um, a lot of folks have been, uh, you know, especially especially those who might not be as comfortable on the on the command line or, you know, manual configuration. Uh, network configuration uh, on the desktop has is has always kind of been an issue, especially with wireless configuration, with wireless uh, Wi-Fi and all that stuff. And uh, so, I mean, like traditionally in FreeBSD, you got to go in and, uh, you know, mess around with WPA software, and if config and all that stuff, you know, on, under the command line. But, you know, especially, especially if someone's just, uh, you know, just, you know, opening up their laptop for the first time and putting FreeBSD on it, putting some desktop on it, and then all of a sudden none of their network works, especially the Wi-Fi, it's like they use it for two seconds and it's like, nope, not, never again. So one of the one of the big asks from the community that I've seen from Discord and IRC and possibly the mailing list as well is some sort of a, some sort of a network manager graphical user interface sort of a deal. So this goes back to what another thing that Eric has ported over, which is or has created that is also in the ports tree called Network MGR. It's actually just a little Python uh, tray program. Uh, that uh, that does a little bit of that WPA supplicant.com for you uh, is able to you know like you can see which uh, which networks are available that are broadcasting all that stuff and there's also another program called Wi-Fi Manager which is kind of the same deal a little bit more advanced but both of those are I would say kind of clutches for the fact that we don't actually have something more integrated so something like the actual network manager from the free desktop project. And that one has interfaces for the, for like a, they have like an NCurses interface, and then they have the various uh, GTK and Qt interfaces for it. Unfortunately for that, uh, there are major architectural issues that prevent it from actually being ported in whole here. Uh, particularly, a lot of Linuxisms, uh, actually maybe even too many Linuxisms, but also it's kind of a monolithic architecture. You can't really separate the library part versus the individual implementations. So that's one of the that's one of the big uh, stumbling blocks, I would say. Um, so I could continue on, but I think some other folks might have some stuff too. Yeah, I, think I agree with a lot of what you have said, but I would even start one step um, earlier on because I'm new to all of this. And this was for me actually a big stumbling point. I mean, um, when you start the FreeBSD installer, it's all text-based. And people tell you uh, you have to add yourself to some groups for graphics and whatnot. So I think the very first step to get people into seeing FreeBSD as a system that's really suitable for the desktop is to treat graphics really as a first class citizen of an operating system. And I know that BSD and Unix is coming from this background of storage and networking. These are the big two points right from the start. But along the way, the rest of the world also moved on to include graphics. And this is what I think still not happening yet on FreeBSD to have it as a integral part, meaning that XORG, the graphics drivers, including the proprietary ones are all tested together and released together and are very easy from the installer to just set I want graphics and then at least go to a, um, um, a terminal that runs on XORG or something. Manu, your, uh, your comments? Uh, yeah, I, I hear all the, uh, all the complain, et cetera, but uh, the, the issue is deeper. Uh, we, First of all, we are not, uh, and we should not be uh, a generic uh, graphical uh, operating system. Uh, when you create an operating system that, uh, that install uh, XORG or WLAMB and 
and, or anything, they usually choose uh, either GNOME, KDE, uh, etc. for you. Or you have some, for example, in the Linux world, uh, some distros that let you choose in the installer what you're going to Seem to be having some audio technical difficulties uh, with uh, uh, Menu, so I have uh, muted him for just a second here. Um, hopefully, uh, this will clear up in in just a moment. Um, I think uh, there is an interesting um, uh, um, an interesting point here, um, and I think you know the FreeBSD as an upstream certainly. Um, our historical practice is that, you know, we're not going to try and make that um, opinionated, opinionated decision that this is the desktop environment that you shall use on, on FreeBSD. Um, but I think that it's a very good point um, that's been raised multiple times during this, uh, this discussion, the, this, this overall summit, um, that friction is a, is a big issue, that if there's uh, something that um, is easily avoided, um, you know, if, if there's a, a minor issue, but it's easily avoided, we really ought to avoid it. Um, it's, it's for, for someone new to the community, uh, it is very unfortunate if there's all kinds of extra steps that are either poorly documented or perhaps unnecessary um, that uh, we, um, we put in the way of, of um, uh, of having a good experience. Uh, let's see, uh, Manu, is your uh, audio working uh, again? I don't know. We can yeah. test. You're good now. Okay. Well, I've yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's Wi-Fi or anything. I've just reduced uh, the window size of Firefox. I don't have any video glitches right now. So yeah, maybe that was related. And I've stopped the webcam uh, from streaming too. So. Maybe it would help with the audio. I don't know. Uh, and yeah, I don't know what I was uh, where where I left. Uh, so yeah, let just just continue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> concerning like uh, everything about uh, FreeBSD, for me, I think FreeBSD provide a, a good base for a desktop. Uh, usage um i've been using for busy on the on the desktop for oh wow i think like 14 years and it's it is currently like like basically right now i'm using goes bsd but uh it's for me it's the same thing uh i don't think for busy should focus on making it more easier for the user to install everything that because it's gonna get too much complicated for FreeBSD. The thing I think FreeBSD has to focus is just having the tool, uh, dunk, the, the packages working really well, the graphics stack working really well, having everything that's graphical uh, network uh, working really well. And I think for me, I've been using for busy for many years. I The only part I've been having problem with is um, Wi-Fi. That's it. For me, it's it's always been Wi-Fi. Uh, it's, I would like to see Wi-Fi get uh, EC support and AX support. 
that's the, basically the, the only problem we mostly have with users is Wi-Fi support. Yeah, certainly uh, uh, at the, the sort of driver lower um, uh, lower layers of the whole system, um, uh, Wi-Fi support is is very much an important thing that that's, that needs some um, some significant uh, effort still. Um, I, I want to bring it back to one topic that's come up here a little bit, um, and that's there was you know the the point raised about uh, Linuxisms um, in the past, um, and I think we we can't deny that in the kind of open source desktop environment world, um, Linux is a um, uh, a key um, a key player, and uh, there is um, you know. We, we sort of, by necessity, there are going to be things that um, we need to adapt and accommodate um, with, with Linux as sort of the, the primary motivator of various things. Um, so I'd like to get your take on um, how we interact in a, uh, in a world where, where Linux is, um, uh, is sort of making decisions. And uh, we have, you know, we have, we have ways of using Linux applications and Linux kernel code, um, the DRM uh, graphics stack is uh, dual licensed code that is shared with Linux, for example. Um, we have the Linux emulator for running um, uh, running Linux binaries natively on FreeBSD. Um, what's, what's your take on how best to interact with that world? Well, I see this uh, from two perspectives. One perspective is running existing Linux applications. So that would be, of course, fantastic if I can just go download something that's available for Linux, but not yet for FreeBSD and just can expect it to run. And uh, the situation as of today is almost there, but I think it could be made a little bit better by not just providing CentOS 7, but also um, a user uh, environment based on Ubuntu or Debian, because that is what most desktop applications are developed for and tested with. So uh, that would make the, the actual running of Linux applications a bit easier. And one technology that I have been working on actually for a long time, app image packages a whole Linux application into just one single file. And there is work underway to get that run on FreeBSD. And having a Ubuntu-based runtime environment would ensure that um, binary compatibility, library compatibility would be much better than what we have right now with uh, CentOS 7. So that's the part of running existing Linux applications. But at least for me, I didn't come to FreeBSD to have a nicer Linux. I actually came to FreeBSD because I expect from FreeBSD things that work like Unix and not like, well, it's not really Linux, but the stack that has been built up on top of Linux and on top of the kernel with things like Dbus, the various XDG specs. Nowadays, there is talk about Wayland and Pipewire and whatnot. And many of those things seem to get started very focused on Linux and more specifically on Fedora and then go from there into the world and sometimes work, sometimes are half broken. That was a reason for me. I wanted to leave all that behind and go to a, to a different Unix. And that's why I came to FreeBSD. All right. And uh, Eric, your thoughts on that? Uh, me? I, I would surely like to see um, desktop fully um, integrated with bsc uh, because uh, it's like I, i'm there's new stuff in mate uh that is it's uh it's um i tried to find my word um it's embedded in in system d and that part like uh i probably when i have time i'm probably going to remove that part from uh one of the package because um there's a lot of things like that and but the thing is other than that software wise like uh, i i ported yesterday uh sublime text for because i wanted it it, it is using linux um uh, on 
on FreeBSD to um, have it working, I don't have a problem with that because if I want a software, if Linux Linuxator is there, I'm going to use it to make my stuff work. But me, it's more on the desktop side. I would like to see some things pop up, but it's the only thing I can see happening on my side is probably that I can do it one day, but it's it's a lot of work. Other than that, me, if I have a piece of software that won't, and I need the Linux Linuxator to run it, I'm going to use it. I don't have a problem with that. The it's I don't have much problem uh, with uh, software when it comes to software. My my issue is mostly like desktop side. All right, uh, thank you. So we are um, approaching the end of our uh, time slot here. I'd like to give everyone uh, a final opportunity to um, weigh in, and if you have any um, final thoughts or or specific things that um, you would like to pass on. Uh, to the broader FreeBSD community. Um, now is your, your opportunity uh, and I'll start um, with it. I'll go in the, uh, uh, in the order on my screen here. So we'll start with uh, Charlie. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so I, I actually fully agree with uh, both of you as uh, downstream folks, uh, you know, like especially with uh, in, in really in all aspects. And, uh, and, and then like just over here at the, with the uh, desktop team and the GNOME team and KDE team and all that stuff. You know, it, it, yeah, it, it's a really delicate, it's gonna be a really delicate balance in trying to, and trying to, you know, balance both, you know, what, you know, what you, Simon, what Simon wants, you know, like with, you know, kind of not doing it the Linux way per se, you know, kind of doing it the classical Unix way, but also being able to support, you know, like those who want to, who are probably coming over from Linux, who probably want to keep their old uh, desktop, their old familiar desktop or running and uh, running, you know, somewhat the same way. So it, it's uh, it's going to be a very delicate balance, but I think we can do it. Uh, and it's just, uh, we just have to put, put some effort into it, perhaps put some, uh, put some even, uh, put some even funding into it because even historically, uh, a lot of folks who are, who don't do uh, desktop development, uh, kind of see desktop as someone else's problem, uh, kind of an afterthought. So maybe something to consider maybe with the foundation or whoever else wants to, wants to fund a desktop project so that uh, whoever doesn't want to use the mainstream ones can have a choice of doing so. Um, as, as for the network stuff, uh, you know, like the, it, it's like, especially with network manager, you know, like it's, and, and actually even the Linux systems, uh, just how network manager actually calls does a lot of Linux syscalls to actually activate or deactivate network interfaces. And it reminds me of like, well, it, it's really a matter of like, wh where do we ship all this stuff? Because we probably have a lot of, uh, we probably already have a lot of interfaces kind of analogous to what the Linux world has. I mean, we, we've done the shim with dev D and U dev pretty well. It works, it works well. And, uh, you know, especially for X and, uh, and a few other things. Now it's just a matter of like, okay, let's connect the other dots. Let's connect the other dots that the Linux world uh, uses, or, or you know, or we have alternatives like Console Kit too. And then, and we'll just uh, go from there and see, uh, you know, see what else we can do. So, yeah, that's really that's really it. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, Manu. Yeah. So uh, I hear all the complaints with uh with quotes around uh and i understand them but uh uh i think that's well there's two problems uh, the problem the first problem is a chicken and egg problem is that people develop uh apps and frameworks like uh dbus and and everything audio like uh what, whatever the the the, the, the name uh, alza and whatever in linux world is uh, they develop it on Linux because uh, their customer is using Linux. And of course, it will be causing problem for us. Uh, the thing is that for years, we tried to uh, adapt this for BSD. Uh, and things that if you take Dbus or uh, Polkit or whatever, uh, everything desktop related, that have Along the year, a lot of problems and a lot of security issue. Just see the the, the recent Polkit uh, CVE that was released uh, a few days ago or, or today or yesterday. Uh, the thing is that 
those frameworks uh, answer a problem. I think they answer it badly, but this is not the, the talk uh, about that. I think that we don't have any alternative for that. Uh, for graphics driver themselves, it's just, uh, I would say, a, a funding issue, but it's not really the case because I've been working for the FreeBSD Foundation to do some of the graphic stuff recently. Uh, the problem is that if nobody wants to use FreeBSD to do desktop stuff, nobody will uh, fund any developer to do uh, graphic stuff on FreeBSD. And I'm glad that the FreeBSD Foundation did that uh, with me last year. I hope that we can continue soon to do that again. But I will understand if one day FreeBSD Foundation tells me, well, sorry, but uh, we cannot, uh, uh, how do you say that in English? Uh, we cannot understand the need for funding you to do graphic stuff if no one is using our graphic stuff. So that's a big chicken and egg problem. Um, I don't know how to solve this. Uh, this is not a, a monologue about how to solve this issue. But uh, yeah, I, I will honestly, I, I hope that a lot of people will join to help me and everyone to work more on graphic stuff. Uh, mostly kernel wise, because if you solve problem kernel wise, a lot of the user problem goes away, usually. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that will be my final word. And if people want to talk to uh, me more about that, feel free to uh, join the hardware track or whatever, or send me mail or IRC or whatever. Okay, thank you. And uh, Eric, your, your final thoughts? Um. For me, um, something I, I would like to see it's maybe uh, people more engaging uh, uh, with uh, tools like uh, Network MGR because um, Charlie was saying like uh, like um, like Network Manager from the Linux world is there's Qt interface, GTK interface, there's a Qt interface, uh, Curse interface, and the the thing is, network MGR is open to um, having all those things. Uh, we we I welcome everyone to even if it's in the ghost busy repo. It's more it's more like my my thing that I made for freebies and ghost busy. Um, uh, if, if anyone that's interested to help with that. It's Python, simple Python. Uh, with Python, you can use Qt, Curse. Uh, so for that, I can welcome everyone from the FreeBSD site to help me make it better because I don't understand everything about FreeBSD and there's probably better way to do it than I'm doing. But the way I'm, I know to use FreeBSD, that's the way that it works. Other than that, um, on the graphics side, I hear a lot of good things. I really like it. Um, I think um, I I would like to see a lot more emphasis in um, the Wi-Fi side. I know it's uh, it's it cannot be done tomorrow. But for me, it's a big thing that we see and goes busy. We miss a lot of opportunity and we there's a lot of users that come from us and my card is not supported. Oh, my card has only, only download at 21 megabits and it's not fast enough. So it's, uh, other than that, for everyone that's involved in free busy and good job, uh, I'll, I'll I'm probably going to still use that for years. So I have not, nothing much complain other than network. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll have some uh, good news on the Wi-Fi front from some foundation funded projects in the, the near future. Um, and uh, that's definitely a very, um, very important uh, aspect that, uh, that we really need to 
to make some progress on. Um, all right, uh, Simon, I'll leave uh, uh, the final word to you. Yeah, I just want to say a very big thank you. And really two things stand out in the FreeBSD world compared to other communities. And that is community and documentation. I mean, this community is so welcoming and helpful, even for a newcomer like myself, who hasn't done this for even a year. There are lots of helpful people. There are There is help in the kernel ongoing for the app images stuff that I was describing. This is really fantastic. Keep it up. Also the documentation, you can really find documentation and that is really great. Okay, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Eric, uh, Simon, uh, Charlie, and Manu for, uh, for taking the time to uh, discuss graphics and downstream distros. Uh, and uh, John, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. So we're going to take another five-minute break. And when we come back, we'll have a session on Beehive, um, chaired by Peter Graham and myself. Oh, and yes, if you want, uh, go run over to the hallway track during our break. Um, we can check more there, uh, especially if we can follow up on some of the discussions we just had over in the hallway track.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is our last technical session of our summit uh, for this summer. So for our last session, we're going to have a kind of working group discussion uh, with Peter Grayhan and myself and a few others about Beehive. So let me see. I, Peter gave me some slides. I'm going to go grab those and share them. And actually, we also need to find Peter. He was on Zoom, but I don't see him now. Well, <clears throat> amusingly enough, I've managed to not find the slides I'm supposed to present. Uh, da, 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 da. There isn't, one can have too many open windows, it turns out, to try to find the right one in Zoom. And there's Peter. Uh, can I just test um, my screen share? Yeah, since mine is not cooperating, why don't you go for it? How's that? Yes, excellent. Thank you for rescuing my inability to get preview to work. <laughs> oh, did... Um... You need, uh, you have a PDF that you wanted to um, display? No, I, I thought you were going to have me display them. So I was trying to get them. Oh, to okay. Them. But that's all right. We're all good. Charge ahead. Um, oh, are we on now? Yes. All right. Um, so uh, I guess we don't have a whole lot of time. So um, that's okay. We, the schedule is kind of shot, but it's all right. This is the last yeah. thing of the day, so we, we, we'll be fine. We don't have a special thing afterwards today, so it's okay. Yeah, so John and I were just going to um, have a bit of a talk about Beehive. I've got a small um, presentation just about some upcoming work. I mean, there's a lot more that uh, I'm not covering, um, but I just decided to kind of randomly pick some stuff, probably more the things that I guess um, I've been looking at. Um, I'm not sure if Andy is around. I guess we're hoping for an ARM update. Yeah, I'll go see. And the other thing is, um, if anybody has questions, we can just answer them on the fly. Okay. And Andy is here. I've, I've, he should be able to join us. All right. So let me just... Uh, run through these. All right, so I've got just a small set of projects here. They're listed in increasing order of complexity and um, decreasing probability that they're going to get done anytime soon. So first up is Vert.io. Um, B 
Beehive's initial device models were only Vert.io. There's been a whole lot added since then, but it's still kind of the workhorse, uh, certainly for Linux VMs and um, FreeBSD, maybe not so much Windows. Um, but uh, the implementation in Beehive is kind of from, you know, 2013 timeframe. The first spec uh, was fairly simplistic. Um, it's the version number is actually called 0.9.5. I don't know why. Um, but in the, it's almost seven, eight years since that was done, there's been a number of spec updates and probably the most important one was Vert.io version one. And um, they kind of rationalized uh, some of the data structures that are, are shared between a host and a guest. It's not, not really that different. Um, but what's happened is that uh, some guests only support version one, they don't support the older version. And some of the device types are only described in version one, there's no 0.9.5. So the longer Beehive supports that, um, the more problems we're going to have with um, guests not supporting it. Probably the most recent one that came up was Vert.io input that went in. Uh, it's actually not supported on Linux in anything other than version one, so we can't use it there. Um, however, uh, there is um, some work uh, that has been done for this, which upgrades, or at least provides all of the infrastructure to upgrade to version 1.0, uh, 1.1. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to put that in soon. Um, one of the problems that we have with Vodo or having to support multiple versions of Vert.io is that um, at a minimum, you want a way to specify which version you want, but you also kind of want the default version to be the latest possible version. But then you have the other problem that, you know, when somebody creates VM, you really want that version to be frozen in time. So we kind of have this problem where, um, you don't really want to uh, be locked into the oldest possible version forever and never be able to move forward. Um, but it's not quite clear how to really represent that. I mean, having to put in a version every single time is kind of a bit of a headache for users. They really shouldn't really, they shouldn't need to know these low level details. Um, so that's kind of an open question with this work is, uh, you know, how do we um, try to move forward, but at the same time, um, not break when we update what the default version is. And the other problem we have is that because there's, you know, older OSs that only support 0.9.5, like if you want to run a FreeBSD 10 VM, um, you know, there's, there's really kind of a compatibility jump between 0.95 and one that if we only support one, we can't work on 0.9. 0.9.5. So one proposal I have right at the end there is just, if we actually just change the name from vertio dash device to just VIO, and then we leave vertio dash is just a way of specifying kind of the, the existing format. So anybody that has an existing config will stay locked into 0.9.5 forever, but that should be okay because that's what they're working with now. But then if we have a new name, then we can kind of move forward and say that that tracks version updates and then that could also have a version specified with it. So um, I'm very interested to know what people uh, think about that. Hmm. My initial thought might be, I wonder if we can just have a Vertio version that defaults to the right thing, but I guess you want it to track in the future and not be fixed at 0.95 as a default forever. So I have to think more about if that would work. Yeah, we definitely don't want to be stuck at 0.9.5. I mean, this, you know, say for example, for Vodai input, it's it's not really very useful at 0.9.5. It only supports Windows, and yeah, you know, we already have X working XHCI for Windows to get uh, input, so it's not it's not so. It, I mean, we could actually just cut 0.9.5 support for that because it hasn't shipped yet. 
and and that would be the same for any additional new device that we supported like if we ever do video um, gpu or something like that um, but it's more a case for you know video and then a video block which are the kind of two most commonly used devices right yeah it probably only really matters for them because like even random, I don't think it would break anybody one way or the other. All right, the next one on my list is um, what I call external USB. So uh, Beehive has a um, XHCI USB controller emulation. Uh, there's currently only one device model which um, is behind that and that's the USB tablet but uh, in theory we could put anything we want there the control emulation is quite complete um, however it's there's kind of limitations with that when you connect a device it's stuck there for the lifetime of the VM and it can't be changed where for USB what you really want is something which is how it's used in real life where you have a physical cable and a plug and you can just walk up to a machine and plug it in so uh, that's kind of useful for a, a lot of different reasons. Um, so my proposal for this is to have a model which is just called remote and it's basically just a proxy where, uh, because USB is already a message based protocol and it already handles attach and detach. Um, we can just have, for example, a Unix domain socket, which uh, just has a um, message based version of USB that goes across it. And then we could have the USB device model be external to the Beehive process. Um, and you just implement the device model there. Uh, so this, this would be one way that you could emulate plugging a USB stick into a Beehive VM. Uh, or if you have a, um, a USB device that you wanted to pass through into Beehive into a VM that was already started, you could just attach it and then you know, run some kind of daemon that just uses libusb to talk to that device and then uses the remote protocol to um, talk to, to, to the hypervisor. Um, and also uh, you could write device models in whatever way or language you wanted to. So for example, you could write a Python script that could emulate a, a USB device. Uh, and this allows functionality to be added to Beehive, um, you know, outside of a release schedule, um, because you could just write a port that emulated a particular USB device, uh, because Beehive doesn't really have to look at any of the semantics of these messages. Uh, you could write, as long as a guest understands that device, you can add that functionality um, to the hypervisor without having to modify the hypervisor itself. Um, it turns out there's a whole lot of different ways of uh, running USB over the wire. Linux has USB IP, which is sort of abandoned. Um, RDP has a remote USB protocol. Uh, the SPICE protocol, I guess it's kind of the QMU specific version of VNC. It also has a remote USB protocol. Uh, they all seem to have advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's not clear that, that even implementing any of those um, would be better or worse than just doing a custom version. So I'm still not really sure what path to go down with that. Um, I haven't really done too much on this yet. One thing I've done is um, Linux has a bunch of test function uh, devices that are very simple, like just echo data from one USB pipe to another. So I have a software implementation of that, and I also have a hardware implementation of that on a Raspberry, Raspberry Pi Pico, um, which can be used to kind of test proxying against real hardware just for a very simple device. But um, there's still a long way to go with this. All right, the next one on the list is GPU pass-through. So this has kind of been kicking around for a long time. I think it's um, been resurrected with a whole bunch of patches that we received from Horvin Cohn, who's from Beckhoff. And he's given us um, a pretty large patch set for Intel GBTD, which is passed through for an integrated uh, GPU. Uh, he's also given us one for a, um, AMD APU, uh, but they're quite large and there's sort of a lot of dependencies on other parts of Beehive changing. So 
in particular, the 64-bit PCI support for pass-through in Beehive is, um, it was a little too specific. The initial version required a Xeon that had um, a large um, number of physical address lines that didn't really work on desktop machines that have in Intel integrated GPUs. So we've had to fix that, but then that there's a cascading required change that's needed in EFI because EFI advertises where the 64-bit hole is uh, to the guest that's running. And then we have to dynamically modify what are currently static tables. Um, so there's more work there. Um, we also seem to need PCI ROM support to initialize uh, GPUs after they've been reset. Um, there's sort of a change of that that came in with some VGA work. Um, so it's, it, on the surface, it sounds like it's not that big a job, but there's just a whole lot of cascading changes um, that have to be done to support it. Um, the other issue too with uh, just entire controller pass-through is you either need a dedicated graphics card and a separate monitor, um, or it takes over the, you know, your existing monitor. And that's probably not too friendly if you have a, a graphic system and you just want to run like a VM in a window. So the solution, at least from Intel for that is called GBTG, uh, which enables you to carve up an Intel integrated GPU into a number of kind of smaller sections. And then you have a slightly modified way of pass through where a guest can access just a portion of the GPU hardware. But to do that, we actually have to modify the Linux DRM code because there's a whole lot of hooks in that to handle this. Um, so that actually seems a fairly complicated piece of work because we have an in-tree portion and then we have an out-of-tree portion and we have to somehow glue those together. Um, NVIDIA's uh, high-end solution is just standard SRIOV. Um, so I think that actually might have the most chance of success without changing anything, but it's also the most expensive. Um, so I don't know, I had plans to do work on GBTG, but um, I've just never really been able to carve out enough time to get to it. And last on my list is uh, moving Beehive to a uh, single process model. So currently there's kind of these separate admin actions of creating a virtual machine running a virtual machine and then destroying a virtual machine. Uh, and there's multiple processes involved there. Uh, and the problem is that there's a resource that's created that lives sort of on its own. It's not really tied to any process. So um, this is one of the reasons why Beehive still runs as root because you don't want to give people the ability to create um, you know, these objects that use a lot of system resources um, and can you know severely impact the operation of the system when these people uh, aren't privileged users um, however if it's tied to a process kind of like anything in unix the resources that are used by a process are accounted for and uh, there's a whole lot of um, limits that you can apply to a process and then also uh, you know, you can re reclaim those resources just by killing that process. So this is how QMU works, or KVM works on Linux. Um, it's definitely kind of fits more into the Unix model. Um, however, the problem that we have with Beehive is that we have to be able to migrate from this kind of separate model that we have into this single process model. <laughs> And the most obvious places where that shows up is where we have an external loader like Beehive Load or Grub Beehive, which kind of run as a separate process and create this VM object. Um, so for Grub Beehive, there's kind of less and less people using that. Um, EFI works pretty good with almost all Linux distributions and has for quite a few years now. So I think, and also Grub Beehive is, um, it's not really being maintained, doesn't support XFS properly. I know Chuck, Tuff, Chuck Tuffley has done a sort of an updated version of that, but it might be simpler just to uh, retire Grub Beehive. 
Um, beehive load for running FreeBSD is still quite useful. And I think we can kind of mimic um, the way it works with a single process just by starting a process in beehive load and then backgrounding it. And then when you run beehive, it actually just picks up the existing process that was created. Um, so we're not actually, we, we still have a, an object that's tied to a process. It's just hidden from the user, but it will at least allow them to carry forward scripts that they have and beehive load itself is still kind of a useful tool. Um, so the other um, reason for doing this, as I mentioned, it, it kind of provides a way to not have to be root to run a virtual machine um, because now we have all the resources tied to an actual process. Um, you know, we can use existing um, limiting um, whatever mechanism you want just to restrict what an actual uh, non-root user can do. And, you know, the ultimate way of controlling this is you just kill the process that's associated with the VM. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure there's probably a lot of things that I haven't thought of here, but at least that's, that's the path that I want to move to, to be able to allow non-root users to uh, run VMs. Um, yep, that's all I had. I mean, there's probably 20 more of these, but uh, we've only got 30 minutes and we probably want yep. to talk about other things. And well, then there's lots of other stuff in progress by lots of different folks. I know for myself, um, mostly I've just tried, I've been spending a, what time I have for Beehive kind of trying to see if I can shepherd in some other things. I have a long backlog of things to help with. Um, probably next to my plate are some of the suspend and resume fixes uh, that other people have contributed as well as some other follow-up patches from UPB on suspend and resume. Um, but I know one, Chunk of exciting work is uh, work on ARM64, which the folks at UPB worked on, but also Andy Turner has worked on. And so Andy's here. I don't know if Andy, you might be able to do a demo of ARM64 booting in a VM under uh, VM. I have one. I can work out just your screen. Your screen. Sure. Mm. Hopefully you can see a um, my screen now. Yeah. At least one yeah. window. And I so I'm I this is a uh, I have a free this is a FreeBSD machine in the room next to me running a fairly recent or a current version of uh, FreeBSD fourteen on an ARM sixty four machine on ARM sixty four. So it's a it's a, one of the, um, it's an in, in the Neo VCN1 development platform that um, has, has loaned us. Um, so I've got been testing and updating the Beehive code from UPB to um, fix a few issues we found and get it into a state that we, I think we are happy with. So, uh, you can see the script at the top I've been running. I'm running, it just runs. I've more, I'm already running the single, or almost a single process model um, because I only support run it booting from EFI on ARM64. So if we if we were to have a single process model, it would be a lot, we, we wouldn't have a problem with ARM64 at all. With this. Um, so unfortunately, I'm. Okay, so I can boot into U boot. I'm not sure why I get a random piece of garbage on the UART. Um, I've I've traced traced it and I saw I've got no idea. Um, but you can see it booting the FreeBSD loader um, and standard FreeBSD. So performance-wise, is it kind of comparable to bare metal and kind of the um, same way as it is on x86? I'm not entirely sure. This is, this is also a neat boot machine. So some of the, I may, we like this issue, we may be seeing some, like it's hanging here, may just be because it's trying to load 
the disk off the network, uh, which might, seems to sometimes be a little unstable. Uh, but for development, it's fine. Development of Beehive, it's fine. I, I would like to you know, actually run a performance, see what the performance is like. I have got a disk in this, in this, um, the, the, this, this server it's running in, but I haven't tried um, right, booting off, be, booting from Beehive off that. And this is another place where I need to look into why it's suddenly slow. Yeah, try a um, MD5-T or OpenSSL speed. Uh, yeah, I, knew, well, I haven't looked at any of this. I can, so, so, so what command was it? OpenSSL. Oh, MD5-T is a simple one. Yeah, it looks pretty good. This is speed. Oh, open open SSL open. speed and then say SHA two five six, for example. Uh, I, I I think no no dashes in front of speed. It's just speed okay. as a command to open SSL. Yeah, so I think uh, you might have a problem with the clock because yeah, the time. Yeah, uh, that's in my. Um, I haven't looked at that. Was my next to look at is the the clock. Uh, I've been focusing recently on um, getting the interrupt controller right, and there's a few still a few issues um, around. Still need to look into level versus edge interrupts and. Um, Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. I should look at the clock once I've got I finished off this interrupt control issue, and it's possibly also related to that. that oh yeah, point, I think I'm um, the clock while I've updated the interrupts. Yeah, the speed the speed test runs for three seconds. It just sets a like a sig alarm, so if times aren't working, yeah, it probably won't come back. Okay, I can look into that later then. Um, and I haven't, I haven't tried to do builds or anything inside of this yet. Most of my testing has just been, does it boot? Well, that tends to test a lot of things as it is. Hmm. Okay. Um, and I have, I'm also tried to boot Linux and NetBSD, but Linux will start to boot. Um, NetBSD, I get. I don't even get any kernel output yet, so I, those are more a couple more things to look into, and I haven't I haven't tried any other operating systems yet. Okay. Well, I think we're actually probably close to the end of the time that we have uh, for our slot today, but that was very cool. Thank you for sharing, Andy. And thank you for your updates, Peter. Um, it is interesting to see how Beehive continues to evolve and grow um, and become a bigger and bigger thing within FreeBSD itself. It's always more stuff for it to do. Um, but thank you, guys. So let's do another five-minute break uh, real quick. This will be our last break. For oh, we actually have some questions. Let me see. Ah, so. Um, uh, we'll take a stab at these two questions before I run into our break. Um, Jason Tubner has asked, the status of live storage resize in Beehive guests? That's an interesting question. So um, I actually have a, a patch series. It's mostly been reviewed, and I have some feedback from Peter I need to address that adds the ability for Beehive to notice, uh, at least for Vertio block, if uh, underlying block, the underlying storage changes size, it propagates and tells the underlying guests and the guest kind of notices and resizes automatically. Um, so that's kind of in progress and I should finish addressing the feedback I got from Peter so I can push it upstream. It doesn't 
support uh, Zvols currently because Zvols will need they need to support the KVent to raise a KVent when their file size changes. But I've from what I've looked at, it shouldn't be hard to add that to Zvols. Um, and then Jason has a follow up question: Will that be easy to port to NVMe? Um, probably as long as NVMe has some kind of way to notify the host, like normally in NVMe, that a, a, a storage is resized. As long as we have an interrupt, we can post. Um, it should just be a matter of wiring up the right bits in the NVMe model to do that. So assuming NVMe, the protocol is a way to do that, it shouldn't be hard to add it. And then Alan Jude oh, and, and Chuck already said, yes, I have patches for that. Outstanding. Um, Alan Jude had asked a question, I think, of Andy, which was, was Andy's demo running on an M1 Mac Mini? Uh, the, no. The answer. I have oh. a I have a Mac Mini, in my Mac Mini, but the uh, the commands you are running under a FreeBSD on a VMware on a an older Mac Mini, an Intel based one, and Beehive was it was SSHed into a Beehive. Um, and uh, well, so the the NFS servers on the Mac Mini actually, but and is this SSH into, into a Beehive, into a FreeBSD booting on an N1 STP, which is the um, ne um, nearest N1 reference platform. Okay. And then one more question uh, we have, which is, are there any plans to support QXL for Windows guests? I'm going to punt to Peter because I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so that's a... Uh, um... Uh, a third IO um, mm. um, kind of GPU para virtualization. Um, so um, I think Kei Hing actually had a working, he might, he might have, so this, I think there's a couple of different variants of this as well. It's the terminology gets a little confusing. I'm probably confused myself now, but basically it's, it's just a way to sort of do, you know, like open, open GL like, um, API pass through so that you can get 3D in a guest without having to implement, you know, a full GPU device model. Um, so the problem, the main problem with that is just the fact that we don't have any 3D graphics in the FreeBSD base system, but Beehive ships in the base system. So for something, for something like this to work, we would need the ability to, um, you know, be able to have uh, like a dynamically loadable VertIO device model that could then link against um, some 3D libraries that came from ports and then at runtime, you know, Beehive could incorporate that. Um, that's probably useful uh, in general and not just for something like QXL, but that's why it can't happen um, right now. Okay, and then we had one other question here, which is someone has a couple of NVIDIA A100s and is asking if there's anything they can do for help. I guess this is maybe in regards to testing SROV. Um, but I mean, yeah, aside just... from testing it, letting us know if it's broken, perhaps. I'm not sure. Absolutely. Yep. And if they, you know, we could always supply updated patches for them to try out to see uh, how things go. Yes. Okay, we have another minute or two to see if any other questions pop up. Okay, well, thank you again, Peter and Andy. Um, and we'll take about a five minute break as a reminder, after our break, we're going to do our closing session. And one of the things we're going to do in our closing session is we're going to do a FreeBSD trivia game, as it were, uh, using the app Kahoot. Uh, you can use a web browser client to do it, or you can use an app on your phone or a tablet. So we'll post some links to, to remind us to Kahoot in the chat. So you can use this time during the break to download Kahoot on your phone if you don't have it, get it set up. And we'll see you all in about five minutes. <laughs>